Simon Fischel is our next speaker, who's founder and president of Care Fertility and the Rachel Foundation. Thanks. Right, a quick eight minutes or less. Um, we've heard an important word in, in, in all that the previous two speakers have said and everything to do with what we're talking about this evening, the word evidence. And, and actually, what is evidence? And, and, and good luck to all of us who, who try to find the evidence because it's not as easy as it seems. We hear banded around an awful lot. It has to be an RCT and nothing but an RCT. But those experts who deal with evidence know full well that there are a whole... Uh, <clears throat> a number of ways, a lot of ways, in which evidence is gained, but what is the acceptable evidence? What is that evidence that's going to be used to support what eventually we're going to do as a discipline? And in fact, if you look at randomized controlled trials, it sits somewhere in the middle of what some authorities call unfiltered information in its own right in any event. They need to be on to more systematic reviews. And sometimes, even when we have those, we get comments such as, well, there's not, not enough of them, or they're not appropriately done or performed. We know that RCTs themselves, there are problems with many of them. So what is the evidence going to be that uh, drives what we're going to try to achieve? Let me give you an example. So uh, um, in about 19, uh, 2007, there was work done to try to improve the PGS uh, that it was at that time, which was believed to be inadequate, least, not least because it was only doing five to nine chromosomes instead of the whole range. And the first baby was born using a technology that allowed us to look at all the chromosomes. And then there was a cry, we need an RCT to, take, to assess polar body use of what was called array CGH technology. So hats off to ESHRA. ESHRA decided they were going to go ahead and do the RCT. And they formed the ESTEEM trial in 2008 to undertake this multi-centre study, RCT, across a few European clinics. And it was the first randomised trial of 23 chromosome testing for polar bodies using array CGH. Nine years on, where are we? No information, no data. Any patients who may have been benefited by this technology wouldn't have been allowed access to it because their lives would be on hold because the RCT hasn't yet delivered. And will it deliver? We don't know. But in the meantime, the field has moved on from polar bodies. It's moved on to day three blastomere biopsies. It's moved on to uh, blastocyst biopsy, as we call it, trophectoderm biopsy. Technology has moved on vastly from array CGH, which seemed to be the real sliced bread at a time. It's moved on in those few years quantitative PCR and now next generation sequencing. This is all the rage and it's highly accurate technology. If we'd just been sitting here still waiting for the polar body array CGH data, actually where would this be? So do we need an RCT for everything? Um, Hans Evers, editor of Human Reproduction, recently wrote an article on this which is worth reading if you, if you haven't done. That's his conclusion. No. I've taken a little poetic license. That's the first line of, of the article. And, of course, it goes into further detail as to why he says that. But it raises almost more questions than it answers it, this article. And, and it's worth a read. So I, I recommend that to you. But I did think the answers were going to come from this paper. Uh, this was one about the adjuncts in the IVF lab. Where is the evidence for add-ons? And I think they came up in their conclusion with exactly the right message. Those advocating and recommending unproven procedures to their patients must ensure that they fully inform the patient of the evidence for its safety and effectiveness orally and in writing. We agree, we agree with all of that. To ensure that people considering treatment using adjunct therapies are in a position to make an informed decision. Absolutely right. They came up with the answer in their conclusion. Trouble is, in the abstract, they start off with, it's alarming that there are currently numerous examples where adjunct treatments are used in the absence of evidence-based medicine and often at an additional fee. But I thought, well, well, but up here they were saying that there is an approach to doing this and it's, and it's information, it's responsible information. But here it's alarming. Is it because it's, it's not evidence-based or it's an additional fee or it's both? So the world, over the last 40 years, have been trying 
to improve IVF technology. And we have improved. Look at the, HF, look at the UK with the HFEA data. 1991, <coughs> live birth rate was 14%. Today, it's just about double that. So there have been improvements. But in fact, at the very beginning, as Adam's mentioned, there was, there was um, an add-on to fertility treatments called IVF. It was done in many countries across the world, but it would definitely be red flagged for the, the, and it will come up on another slide that I've got, the same data that Adam showed you. And all the others that are now mainstay, they will all be red flagged when they were innovated. And now they are the staple of the infertility world, the staple of infertility treatment. Now this is a really interesting piece of data that I've only recently acquired. And it was looking at the one country in the world, and all credit to it, that really only wants to introduce anything that's evidence-based, however you get the evidence, and that's Holland. And here's the data of the 13 clinics in Holland and the live birth rates. And these are the top 13 clinics, because I might as well pick the sweet ones, in the UK and the US. And what did it show? Interestingly, here we have all the uh, data, about 23, 24% was the highest from about 13% of the Dutch clinics. There is the HFEA audited data for the United Kingdom, and that's the SART data for the US. And that is the UK national average, which sits just above the best clinic in Holland that only uses evidence-based approaches doesn't say very much, and it might put the cat amongst the pigeons, but you know, I wonder if there is a connection to trying to be responsibly innovative in our practice. And let's not forget these guys, as Adam mentioned. And here you can see that, you know, how long were they going to fight the battle? And Adam's showing you the data here, and clearly if they'd stopped at a 466 cycles, they wouldn't have even managed a 1.8% <coughs> per embryo transfer pregnancy rate, or live birth rate. So that doesn't even take into account what was going on simultaneously. And of course, many of you may know, minute, Simon. I'm, I'm just, well I'm just finished. One, one of you, many of you may know that if it wasn't for the Del Zio case in the United States, they may well have had the first IVF baby. It was going on in many parts of the world. And if you added that to here, the success rate would be even lower. Many of us in this room, if not all of us one day, will be very grateful to the add-ons to medicine, the unevident breakthroughs that these guys had done over the years in the history of medicine. But I have to also just mention here Leonard Thompson, because he was a patient, 14-year-old boy, that was to get this unevidenced first treatment of the first production of insulin. Patients, too, are involved in the pioneering spirit, and therefore... We have to recognise that all are concerned in this endeavour to try to improve responsibly what we do. Thank you very much. Thank you.